I don't mind that song dating me. I hope it also indicates something of the hunger of my heart. I love it. I uh, told Jerry the day I told him he ought to learn some of the good songs. And uh, I don't think he'd ever heard of that song. But that night he watched he was in the hospital with me unexpectedly in the pastor when my heart stopped beating and I took off on a revival and uh, Jerry and the pastor came in after I got back and uh, they said something to me and I said boy I've been in a meeting I said, you boys don't have to worry. You weren't there. <laughs> and, uh, but he's been singing that song ever since. <clears throat> I'll tell you, uh, most of you know that I'm on dialysis three times a week. And uh, these meetings that I'll take like this will be very, very, very rare. I'm going to take... Uh, meetings on Sunday and I'm having a struggle learning how to trust God to do as much on Sunday as I want him to do because that's just one shot at people two shots and that's a pretty tough job I have 20 invitations to conferences where I'll fly in on Thursday afternoon and preach Thursday night and preach Friday morning and fly back home I have 20 invitations to do that but it's going to be quite a different story with me. And uh, when my doctor told me what I had to face, I had quite a battle of quitting doing something that I've been doing for 35 years. It was quite a unique job. God had to work on my heart. I had to come to the place that I couldn't, he could, and he must, or I was out. And, uh, but I'm as excited tonight I really am, as I've ever been in my life. Amen. I really am. About three weeks ago, uh, the Lord started talking to me about some things up the road. And boy, I got excited. <clears throat> so, uh, I'm looking forward to what the Lord's going to do occasionally when I come across some meeting like this that I really feel I need to be in uh, the people transfer the Dallas equipment and all that stuff to wherever I'm going to be and we just do it on the road I won't be here in the morning I'll be getting a dialysis but don't you worry I'll be having myself a time amen I don't feel it and I usually have three hours when I can just, whatever God wants to do, we just have a time. And so uh, I'll be down in Hammond doing that uh, in the morning, but I'll be back tomorrow night and for the last service. I'll tell you, tonight, the Lord has pulled a good one on me. Uh, he really has. He, he has put on my heart a message that I guess I have been preaching at Milldale for at least 20 years. And many of you have heard it, but God's impressed me that you needed it again. And uh, you, you'll find out after I get started. Because it's centered around an illustration where God morally changed my life. Now what I mean by that is this. When I believe when a person responds to God properly, their life is morally changed. Now, I do not necessarily mean their morality is changed, yet I do mean that. But I mean by the, using the word morally, I mean their whole disposition is changed, never to be the same again. And tonight, I'm going to bring a message, and it, they're in out of, the, out of this message, is a illustration that happened to me 
And when it happened, my life has never been the same since that day. And I feel like a great deal of what God is doing right in my life today, and especially in the last nine months, which includes eight months out of the ministry, if you want to say I was out of the ministry, uh, where I could not preach officially in pulpits, uh, God, all of that time, relates right back to this story tonight. Now, not most of you know that I uh, am a great preacher. I mean, I'm not a great preacher, but I preach a great deal on faith. Now, I had a man to tell me one time, in fact, Brother Jimmy Robinson's father, he said you could listen to a preacher preach, and find out his problems. And so, uh, I, I think that he had me nail quickly, plainly, that I've had a great deal of problems with faith. And God wanted to build this message in me. And um, so I spend a lot of time on it. And I spend a lot of time dealing with it. And tonight I want to deal with faith, but I'm not going to use the word faith. Now I'm going to deal with another word I'm not going to use too much. It's the word obedience. Now when you have faith, it's like a coin. One side says faith, the other side says obedience. One side said obedience, the other side says faith. There is no such thing as passive faith. There's no such thing. Now, there is passive belief. Now, some people would call belief faith. Now, I wouldn't. And I realize that we preachers contradict each other a lot of times, not in meaning, but strictly in our uh, words that we use. We contradict each other. I got up and preached on faith one night, and uh, Jerry Falwell didn't hear me preach. And he came right up that I mean the first statement out of his mouth, he said there's a passive faith. Well, after the service, me and him had a set to. And, uh, <clears throat> but he, you know, I understood what he meant, but those people didn't understand what he meant. But uh, it was a matter of semantics. It wasn't a matter of meaning. But there's no such thing as a passive faith. When you have faith, you have obedience. When you have obedience, you have faith. Now, I'm going to preach on faith tonight. I'm going to preach on obedience. But I'm not going to use those two words to in the message as far as preaching unless I just try to drop them in to help your understanding. Now, out of the book of James, we find, beginning, I believe, at the 22nd verse of the book of James, we find these words, But be ye doers of the word, and not hear us only, deceiving your own selves. For any, now listen to this, for if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is likened to a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continue therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deeds. Now there's another passage that I want to give to you out of Matthew 7. Now, I don't know about you, but I have known Matthew 7 from the time I was too young to remember. Now you may remember it like I do. Back when I was a little boy in Sunday school and church, they taught me this passage of Scripture. But I never knew it had such meaning. And possibly you used to sing this when you were a child about building your house up on a rock. And the winds would come and blow and the house would stand. And the building the house up on the sand and the winds would come and the, well, the wind would come and the house would fall flat and you'd clap your head. I remember singing that as a little child. But I never knew that it had the message that I see tonight out of it. 24th verse of the 7th chapter 
of the book of Matthew. Therefore, whoso heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him to a wise man which built his house upon the rock. And the rains descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell not for it was founded upon a rock. Isn't that beautiful? Now how is, how can a man build on a rock? Just ask yourself that question. How can the man build on a rock? The rock of ages. How can he do it? Two things. He has to hear the word and he has to be a doer of it. Listen to this next verse. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be like unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rains descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. My, what a message. I'll tell you, that's a passage that would do for every parent to read when they start their family. Wouldn't it? Don't you think so? Amen. I'll tell you, that is a promise, brother, about building your house on the rock, building on sand. Now, I trust that you have picked up something out of these two verses, or two passages, that's common. And I think the moment I mention it, you'll see it if you haven't seen it. And that is this. In both passages, people hear the word. They hear the word. Now, I'll tell you, a lot of times preachers preach and we do not hear the word. Sometimes it's because they don't preach the word. But sometimes they preach the word and we do not hear the word. And definitely there's a mystical attitude, a mystical thought here of hearing the word. God taking the word to our hearts. We hear the word. And not only do we hear the word, but when we hear the word, there's one more thing we've got to do with it. And that is we have got to be a doer of that word. We've got to be a doer of the word. Now I want to ask you a question. How, having heard the word, how can you be a doer of the word? Now if you said by faith, you'd be right. But faith is such a theological word that when you say faith, it's almost like saying love. A person's mind goes 15,000 different directions. That's right. Amen. You know, we don't even know what it means anymore. So how can you be a doer of the word? If you said by faith, you'd be right. But it seems that when you say that, people just do not get what you're saying. Or if you said, well, how can you be a doer of the word? By obedience. Now that has a little more meaning to me that I can pick up some movement in it. And I can pick up something that's nearer to me than even the word faith. Now, obedience. But that is a theological word that we just seem to get lost in the meaning of it. How can you be a doer of the word? Now remember this, in the context that you have heard, how can you be a doer of the Word of God? Now if you take this statement out of the context in which I have placed it, uh, you will be misrepresenting me, you will miss the message, and you will not know the meaning of what I'm talking about. But in the context that you have heard the word. How can you be a doer of the word? Listen to me. And I will not say anything more profound and yet more simple than what I'm about to say. The only way you can be a doer of the word of God in the context that you have heard it is by choice. Amen. You didn't say amen, you don't understand it? Oh, what's the matter? Is it too simple? Now, 
Now, if you haven't heard the word, you might have an explanation out of <clears throat> making a choice on it. But he says, having heard the word, be a doer of the word. And the only way you can do it is by choice. I'm sure that your intellect and your emotions are involved here. I'm confident that. Because you've heard the word. You have received light. You receive truth. The only way you can be a doer of that word is by choice. And don't you worry about your feet. Don't you even worry about your body. When you make the choice in your heart to be the doer of the word, I've got news for you. Your body will cooperate with your choice. Amen. And your feet will cooperate with your body. Everything else about you will cooperate with that choice. That's right. You were lost, dead in trespasses and sin, headed to hell. And one day, the Spirit of the living God took the Word of God and stabbed it through your spirit, soul, and life. And you saw yourself a sinner. Jesus, the righteous Son of God. And Jesus paid it all. And somehow, some way. Back there in that seat or in that corner on that altar, my dear friends, seeing the hearing the truth, I'm a sinner and Jesus is the Savior. You came to a choice. And when that choice was made, your entire body responded to that choice. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That choice is not made on the basis of plain intellectualism or emotionalism. That choice is made on the basis of God speaking the truth to your heart. That's saying the same identical thing if you said to a man, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. When he's convicted, he's a sinner. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's saying the same thing. If you obey the Lord, He's speaking to you tonight, obey it. How do you obey it? How do you believe? How do you, are you become how do you become a doer of the Word of God? Now you can make a choice, folk, that won't mean a hill of beans. Because it's strictly on the basis of your intellect. You can make a choice strictly on the basis of your emotion. It won't mean a thing. But when you have received the truth, and you make that decision on the basis of having received the truth, that's the way you become a doer of the Word of God. And I'll assure you, your life will be morally changed. You know what happened? The truth that you have obeyed, you have believed, you have become a doer of, by that decision in your heart, will be taken off the pages of this book and turned into reality in your life. Yes, sir. That's growing in grace. That's getting saved. Same way you got saved, the same way you grow in grace. Colossians, what, 2, 6 says, As you receive Jesus Christ, your Lord, so walk ye in him. Now I want to tell you a story. I cannot tell you how much this story has influenced my life. It really happened to me in Greer, South Carolina. Many years ago, at least 25 years ago, I flew out of Memphis, Tennessee to Greenville, South Carolina when they still had an airport at Greenville. They have one now between Greenville and Spartanburg. I flew up there. My friend Curtis McCarley met me, took me out to his house. Saturday afternoon, Sunday morning, I was going to start a revival meeting 
in Tryon, North Carolina, just up the way a little ways. Curtis said, Brother Manley, have you ever been to one of these old-fashioned camp meetings in Carolina? I said, no, never have. He said, I'd like for you to go. I'm going to be the preacher next week. He said, this week someone else is preaching. Would you like to go tonight and just see, see one for yourself? And I said, I'd love to go. And I went out there, and they had a tabernacle there, seat uh, hundreds of people, just a roof over their heads. That's all they had. And brother, I'll tell you, they would, they would sing for about two hours. Now, I didn't say sing. I said sang. And they, they did it. They did it, brother. They sang. And I mean, old Billy Kelly was as wide as this pulpit. And he was leading it all. I mean, they, they would get with it. And they would sing. And they would shout. And they would do all kinds of things that I didn't bother me too much. But uh, I'd been used to a little shouting. <clears throat> and I mean, they'd get with it. And... Um, I watched that crowd. In fact, there was one of those men that had a baby on his hip. And that man would run down the aisles passing the poles that kept the t tabernacle up and run up on the piano with that baby on his hip. Run across the top of the piano. Run across the choir rail. This is a two by six up here. And that was a two by four. I looked at it. And he ran across that choir rail on that two by four came down the other side, the organ, right down the out, right up the, I mean, just shouting. I'd never seen nothing like that now. But I mean, he shouted. <clears throat> there was another one. I'm just telling you about three. This went on for about two hours. There was another one that would run up and down the aisles and they had, not sh uh, sawdust, but shavings. Shavings, you know, on the ground. And this fellow would get down on the ground and pick a handful of shavings up and throw them up in the air. Just let them come down and shout. And then there's one more I'm going to tell you about. He would run up to those posts in that tabernacle and uh, I mean just scoot right up them. And get up there and just shout and then scoot right down them. You said, now Brother Manley, uh, I don't care for stuff like that. I don't know that I asked you for an opinion. <laughs> Did I? If you were like me, you'd been sitting there saying, Oh God, I don't want to have an opinion unless you put something like that on me. I don't. Amen. I tried to keep myself to myself. I guarantee you. I was afraid God might make me do something like that. Amen. So I was sitting there quiet as a mouse. <laughs> My brother, Curtis McCarley, who's now in glory, probably shouting over all this tonight. He just, he just say, amen, amen. You know, he just, and I'll tell you, I was just, I wouldn't even say amen. I just, I just watch it. <laughs> they shouted and they shouted and they shouted. They had a good time. Now I have preached in those camp meetings. In days, since those days. And I'm too much of a prophet for a camp meeting. Because they tell you, they come down there to shout. That's right, brother. And I usually preach a shout out of people and not in them. And, I, and I, I'm not a camp meeting preacher. They just won't have me often. But I've been in most of those big camp meetings in the Carolinas. And oh my, they're precious. But you've got to be, you've got to know that they come down there to have a good time and just shout about well, I'll guarantee they don't have any trouble with Pentecostals up there in that part. <laughs> they scare a Pentecostal half to death. <laughs> I guarantee. <clears throat> and they didn't have any problem with them for years. And I'm not making fun of them, folks. I mean, them, them old timers knew how to shout. Yeah. Well, it came time for the offering. And when they started taking that offering, I want you to know there was not a peep, much less a shout. I mean, no one said anything but the man in the pulpit. And here's the way he started it. And I'm not making fun of him tonight, but this is the way it was funny. But I didn't laugh. 
I guarantee you, I wasn't about to do anything. And uh, he said, who'll give a hundred? Who'll give a hundred? Who'll give a hundred? I thought I was at an auction. And then he dropped down, who'll give 75? Who'll give 75? Who'll give 75? Down to 50, down to 50, who'll give 50? And they'd stand up and say, I'll give so and so. And when they'd get that few, they'd go down to 25, got down to 10. Well, I was sitting there and I, I didn't consider myself too spiritual. But I was spiritual enough to know that when God had made me a part of a meeting, I had an obligation not to give to that meeting, but to obey God. So I was sitting there. I had $8 in my pocket. The story's coming back to some of you, isn't it? You want to get up and run now before God gets hold of you? <laughs> I had $8 in my pocket. I had $8 sitting there, and I, I, uh, I knew to ask God what to do. But I, I, I did it like this. I said, God, I got eight bucks. I'll give you the three and I'll keep the five. I didn't let God tell me what to do. I didn't give him a chance to tell me what to do. I offered him the three and I'd keep the five. And here's the reason. That day when uh, I think I packed that Marthy and I forgot my shaving kit and I had no shaving equipment and I had no checkbooks, no credit cards, and I knew I had to have a good fresh shave and my teeth had to be brushed the next morning before I could go to that revival meeting. And I knew I had to have some equipment. So I just offered God the three. That was a logical thing to do. And I'd keep the five. But I didn't give God a chance to tell me what to do. I just told Him what I was going to do. Well, when He didn't say anything to me, He got silent. I knew it was my next move. When God gets silent, folk, it means you're headed in the wrong direction. You're out of distance. So I backed up and I said, Well, Lord, I will give you the five and I will keep the three. And I didn't give him a chance to say anything. I didn't. I had settled it. Well, I was watching him beg those people for that money. And I was so embarrassed, I made a statement like this. I said, I wish to God I could get up and tell these people how to have a faith offering. Now, what did I mean by that? I meant, my dear friends, that each individual simply asked God what to do and let God tell them what to do. And then they do it. That's a faith offering. I can't stand these preachers who shut you up to an offering that doesn't have God in it. I never take an offering. I always let God take it. But I'll tell you what, I learned it this night I'm telling you about. In case I ever take an offering, it falls flat on his face. But God never misses. I said, I wish I could tell them. What about a faith offering? You know how things that you can say in a second and things that happen in a second have happened so fast you don't know how it happened? I said that. And about that time, Billy Kelly said, we have a Bristol evangelist here tonight. Uh, from Mississippi. I was living in Mississippi at that time. He said, I'm going to ask him to come up here and thank God for this offering. And said, by the way, Brother Manley, while you're coming up here, if you have something to say to us you'd like to say to us, feel free to say it. I just told God I'd like to say something. I got up there and you folk had known me a long time like Harold Brown and Kenneth Wall and some of you other fellas, Preston Holder and Jim, you, you know, I used to be mean as a devil. I mean, I, I just I just didn't, I mean, I would almost be mean as a devil without having any cooperation. And I mean, boy, I, it's, I was tough. Amen. I mean, real tough. And I was tough that night. I said, folks, 
I said, I've watched you. All your singing around here, you were shouting all over this building. But when this offering started, you hadn't said a word. And I said, you either are ignorant of the things of God or you're just a bunch of hypocrites. Now, I wish I'd... I have apologized every time I told this story about that. I, I, I shouldn't have called them hypocrites. Because you'll, know, you'll see in a moment who it almost turned out to be the hypocrite. And uh, I said, you know, I'd like to tell you something. I said, do you know what a faith offering is? A faith offering is when God, by providence, Brother Ron, you said a lot last night in that providence. God's always put me in those providential things. Amen. Somebody always asked me, he said, Brother Manley, why do you do things your way? Brother, I don't ever do them. I just get in them. I mean, they just get that. And I was providentially in that situation that night. And those people were providentially in that situation that night. And I said, you know what a faith offering is? It's bowing your heads before the Lord and saying, Lord, what do you want me to do? And I said, when the Lord tells you what to do, now listen to me, He usually tells you to do something you can't afford. Because, my dear friends, it wouldn't be faith if you could afford it. Amen. He usually tells you to do the unusual, the abnormal. And I said, tonight, why don't you just bow your heads and thank God for this offering. I told him, I said, I can't thank God for this offering. He didn't take it. And he hadn't taken it. They had taken it. And you study Corinthians and those churches where they took offerings. And Paul and all those men, they let God take the offering. Amen. Now they were used in instructing the people, but they let God tell the people what to do. Never did they say, well, you're supposed to give $1,000. Amen. God told them. Well, I said before we pray tonight, I want to read you a verse. And it says this. I said, the Bible says give and it shall be given to you. I asked them, I said, is that the word of God? And boy, they started shouting. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Shall men give unto your bosom. For with the same measure that you measure it out, give it out, it shall be given to you again. I said, is that the word of God? Boy, they said, praise God. I mean, folk, they shouted around there. Now that crowd would shout at the drop of the hat and they'd drop the hat for it. I mean, they'd, they'd believe that was a word of God. I said, if you have heard the word tonight, I said, how can you be a doer of that word? Ask God show, to show you what to do. And when He shows you what to do, you will have to come to a decision in your life to obey, to believe, to be a doer. And when you do, God will make this truth real from the pages of this Bible into your life. I said, let's pray. And brother and sister, we started praying. God through praying. And I said, if God has spoken to you, not me, but God, if God has let you hear and you've heard He's spoken to you, you obey Him. And here those saints begin to come down the aisles, bringing their offering to the plates. And I'm going to tell you, folk, it was glory. And I was standing there really rejoicing because they were giving, I mean they were giving according to the direction of the Lord. 
and the power of hell had been broken. They said they had never been able to raise the money they needed. And from that day to the last time I checked, and that camp meeting is still going on, they had never had another financial problem because they simply learned how to let God take an offer. I was standing there watching all of that. And God said something to me. He said, eight dollars. <laughs> I said, Lord, I've got to have a razor and a toothbrush. I argued with God. I even told him I could borrow a razor, but I couldn't borrow a toothbrush. <laughs> I did everything I could to get out of obeying. But finally, folk, God simply said to me, he said, now, who's the hypocrite? You've heard. Now will you obey? Will you do? Will you believe? And when I got to the place of obeying, becoming a doer of the word, believing the word, you know what my hand did? My hand reached in my pocket. When I made that decision, my hand reached in that pocket and got all that money and I walked over and just dropped it in. Amen. Now I want to tell you, I, didn't, I couldn't understand how God was going to solve my problem. But that wasn't my business. My business was to obey Him. To believe Him. To trust Him. And before I could get out from under that tabernacle that night, a man walked up to me and said, Preacher, I hope you won't think I'm stupid. But he said, God told me tonight that you needed some shaving equipment. And said, This afternoon I bought a kit with everything a man would ever want in it. He said, Would you mind taking it? And I saw God, folks get up off of the pages of this book Amen. and become a living reality Amen. in my life. And you may not believe it, but I have never been the same since that day. I have told this story and I can name you at least three writers that's written books that have started with this story. They didn't tell it in there, but I guarantee you if you'd go and ask them, They'd say, I got this when I heard Brother Manley tell that story. Some of them have had their whole ministry centered around preaching on giving. And the books have been bestsellers. And it's been amazed to me how God has used it. But I, my life has never been the same since that day. I, I learned that, friend, when God speaks, you can become a doer of the word. And when you do it, God presses it down shakes it together, runs it over, and causes men to turn around and give unto your bosom. God keeps his word. Amen. I mean, he does it. He does it. He'll do it every single solitary time. When I got to the room that night, I stayed with the McCarlis. When I got to the room, I did not realize, but some, for some reason, I... Uh, looked in my pockets and I just realized that I in my this suit was given to me the other day because I didn't have a suit to preach in because I've lost so much weight I weigh the total amount of 142 pounds I mean I'm a big fella most of you knew me when I was 219 pounds and wore a much bigger suit this is size 42 I used to wear 44 and everything, I, and Martha and I went and got a couple of sport coats the other day so I'd have something to wear down here. And every one of the pockets are sewed up on it. Bless God, I'm going to undo them tonight but I, before I get, come back tomorrow night. Because when I got to my room that night, I did not realize it, but people had walked by me and put money in my pockets. And I think, if I remember correctly, that was about 38 or $40 in my pockets. Did you say, Brother Manley, did you give to get? No. 
I gave to obey. I gave to be a doer. I gave to believe. And God says, when your motive is right in doing it, He said, I'll press it down, shake it together, run it over, and I'll cause men to give into your bosom. Amen. I'll never be the same. How can you be a doer of the word? Having heard it, having heard it, you've become convinced that God has spoken to you. You make that choice to obey, to believe. And folk, I have used this illustration tonight to teach you a principle, a truth that's applicable to every facet of life. Like tonight, you have heard run open up the truth of God about a very serious area in every person's life in this building. I know if you're saved, you have gone through the struggle of Romans 7. And you've heard. And if you go out of here and forget what you've heard, you just go right back into your old sin. But my dear friend, there's more to it than that. When you've heard, you are faced with a decision. Will you obey? Will you obey? This message that I've given tonight and this illustration I used, and I know it's applicable to money, but it is also applicable to every facet of spiritual growth you as a child of God have to face. Amen. Yes, it is. So I trust tonight that God will use this message again as it has been used many, many, many times. Right here. I don't, I don't even have the slightest idea how many times I have brought this message right here at this camp. But I never remember when God did not use it to change lives forever. Yes, sir. I trust tonight that you'll be a doer of the word and not a hearer only. For if you are a hearer only, you build your house on the sand. And the storms are coming one day, friend. Don't tell me the storms are not coming. I just waded through one. Amen. Some people say, how do you do it, preacher? I crawl up in the cliff of the rock and wait till the storm passes by to come out. And folk, let me tell you something. The house did not fall. And almost a half a million dollars worth of bills was paid. The house didn't fall. Everything I'd always taught all these years, my friends, he did it. He did it. Along the way, I was growing just like many of you. Made mistakes here and there. But folk, when the real test began to come, I found that the house was built on the rock of ages. Yes, sir. Now you can be a hearer of the word tonight and you go out of here and forget and you build your house on the sand. And one of these days when the storm comes, it's going to fall. And the fall may be worse than you ever anticipated. So I trust you've heard. And I trust that you will obey. Now you say, well, Brother Manley, are you going to take an offering? No, I don't have to. Is Brother Jimmy going to take an offering? He doesn't have to. He may give you a chance to obey God. Amen. I didn't preach it to take up an offering tonight. I preached this because the Lord dealt with my heart last night about 2 o'clock and told me to do it. I couldn't sleep, so I just sat down in the room in there and prayed and asked God what to do tonight. So I've obeyed the Lord. I think I've obeyed the Lord. He allowed me to say $8 in a few minutes. <clears throat> he may. 
But you see, if he tells me, he tells me, I know he's got Joseph down in Egypt waiting to take care of me. But if I get it out of you like some of these television evangelists get it out of you, and you go off into soulish and give some money because somebody's going to go broke if you don't give them a little money. Then the sooner you go broke, the better off you'll be. But folk, if you obey God, and God tells you to do this certain things here and there, you'll be in the doer of the Word. Let me tell you something, friend. Long before you ever decided to obey Him, he had it all arranged to take care of you and meet your need when the time comes. Huh. Amen? Yeah, he's got old Joseph down in Egypt building up the grain so when the famine comes, that bunch have somebody to go to and get a little food. I, at best I can figure it out, Brother Ron and Brother Jimmy, God was about 17 or 18 years ahead of that bunch. And I figure he's about 17 or 18 years ahead of you and me. Don't you? Amen. I'll tell you, folks, I don't want to do anything but trust him. I don't want to do anything but obey him. I don't want to do anything but be a doer of the word of God. Well, I've said enough. I'm through.